There you go. I don't know, one of the ladies going to set up. Do you guys know? So next Wednesday night, we need to, okay, we need to set up for, for Sunday morning. Okay. Oh, got it. So the, the ladies are going to work Saturday. Okay. Uh, so this is the last lesson on this subject area. 13 lessons. That's pretty short for me. 13 lessons. And uh, I've decided what I'm going to teach uh, next when I come back. Not next Wednesday, but the following week is Wednesday. Next Wednesday, by next Wednesday, I'll have about 30 or 40 fish. And uh, unless I need But, uh, but I'm going I'm to teach on the uh, exaltation of Jesus Christ. Every time, every time I, uh, every time I turn to Philippians two, it it speaks to me, and uh, a, whole, a, a whole bunch recently. So I want to talk about uh, the exaltation of. Jesus Christ. And it's going to be a very lesson-centric study. By that I mean I'll be using the, the whiteboard every night, every every Wednesday. Uh, and I enjoy teaching that way, so I hope you'll uh, look forward to yourself the opportunity. See, the thing that we don't understand about Jesus Christ that, that I want to make sure we understand is that Jesus was exalted because of what he did beyond who he once was. Because of what he did, he was exalted to a higher degree. I want to make sure that we understand that. And of course, before he was exalted, he was uh, humbled and humiliated. So tonight we're going to close this study. And as we ended last week, we were in John, and I mentioned how Jesus had indicted the Jewish leaders in John 5.29. He said, you search the scripture, the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. You see, the, the, the leaders that Jesus is talking to, both in John 5, 29 and in Luke 16, those individuals understood that the, the Old Testament had the good news of eternal life contained in it. That the Old Testament presented a way for them to be reconciled to God and enter into eternal life and into the presence of God in, in the heaven of heaven. They understood that. So Jesus says, You search the scripture, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. But then in that 40th verse he says, But you are not willing to come to me that you may, not, that you may have life. They weren't willing. Everything they needed to know was contained in those scriptures, but they refused to equate those scriptures to Jesus. So we're going to look at that a little, a little bit deeper. Now in the same gospel in John 7, in 742, it says, Has not the scripture said that Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem? where David was. Okay? Isn't that what the scripture said? Yes, it did. Micah 5, 2. Many of us know that. Uh, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. Another prediction in regards to the city of Bethlehem. 2 Samuel 7 says it very, very clearly that the Messiah would come from the lineage who would be from the son of David. He would be a son of David. The Old Testament has a lot of stuff. And all that stuff in regards to these prophecies resolves in itself in the New Testament in Jesus Christ. Of the seed of David, born in Bethlehem, who dies and rises again. Okay? So these Bible experts, these are the these are the highest trained theologians in their country, in the nation Israel, had all of this information be held before them. And there's even more when you look at Romans 3, which uh, we've looked at previously in our Sunday morning lesson, but look at Romans 
Romans 3 for me and look at the 21st verse. And it says in Romans 3, 21, But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, but now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, that's a very important phrase, apart from the law, apart from the law, so, and what's that, what's that telling you is that apart from your being able to keep the law, which you can't, because if you break one of them, law, how many have you broken? You've broken them all. So you can't keep the law. And then he says, apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. And then it says, but now the righteousness of God is apart from the law is, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, okay? And the law and the prophets is the same as Moses and the prophets. So in the in the uh, in 321, what you have is the subject matter is righteousness, okay? And the righteousness of God, see, the first thing you have to understand about righteousness. What is the source of true righteousness? Amen. God. Okay? Well, you look at me and say, oh, well, yeah, well. But the thing is, is that the Pharisees didn't believe that. The Pharisees didn't believe that righteousness was the source. God was the source of righteousness. The second thing that I want you to see, that this righteousness, if this, this, if God fulfills two things in the conveyance of this righteousness, the penalty and the precepts of His righteousness. How is how how is how is the penalty paid by by Jesus on the cross? And how are the precepts of the law met? By Jesus on the cross. Because what's the precept, what's the precept of the law? Perfection, is it not? So, when you have these two, then you have the conveyance of righteousness to mankind. And Christ's death, remember we talked about substitution. His death, his substitution, paid the penalty for those who failed to keep the law. Because, and he could do that because he kept the law. He is, Jesus is more than a, just the substitute. He's the perfect substitute. Because he keeps the precept of the law. And it's in his perfection, he, he is able to meet the, God's criteria. What's God's criteria? It is, it, it, listen, listen, Christians. God's criteria for you tonight is holiness. That's his expectation for your life is holiness. Not anything else. He expects holiness. Because his son, he wants you to be the most you can be like his son. Jesus, in his perfect obedience, met all the requirements of God's law. And thus, he provided what we would call in theology a comprehensive righteousness. Okay? All right. So let me go on. And listen to that last phrase then again. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of the law is now revealed is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is witnessed by the law and the prophets. Okay? So, there was no excuse for anyone in the Old Testament times not to know Jesus Christ. No excuse. You know, 
we, we, we repetitively speak in this lesson of the Law and the Prophets, Moses and the Prophets, and Paul says that it is those that testify to the fact that the righteousness of God is granted to a sinner apart from the law. Now you can try to live a righteous life all by yourself. Go ahead. Don't rely on God. Go ahead and live what you believe is a righteous life. Do it the best you can. But you're not going to keep it. And that's why you have to have an ingredient in here The ingredient of faith. Because if you have big faith, you have the ability for big holiness. But when you have little faith, you don't get you don't get a result of big holiness. The, Of whom are the fathers, 
and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, the eternally blessed God. Amen. At least eight advantages that the Jews had. Advantages that they had. And yet, they didn't read all those and, and put them in better words than advantages, they're drastic privileges. They're God-given privileges. That's a lot of privileges. And yet, Paul continues in 10.1, in spite of all those privileges, Paul says, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. All those privileges and Paul's praying that Israel will be saved. And he continues in verse 2. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. I know a lot of people with a zeal for God. They have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They're posers and not possessors. They have a zeal for God. And they don't have any clue who he is. He's saying they got a lot of passion. You can't question their passion. But it's not according to knowledge. Passion without knowledge does no good. And remember we looked at that word, listen, aku, that word that we get acoustics from. See, what's wrong, one of the things wrong with modern Christianity is it's not any good unless you feel good. That's not good. People go to churches because it makes me feel good. That's not good. True salvation is a spiritual relationship with God that is the result of responding to what you know as the truth. The truth. You are responsible for knowing the truth. That mean, that's what it means back there when Paul says that they, they, according to knowledge, to gain knowledge is to know the truth. Continuing back where we are in verse in chapter 10 of Romans, in verse 3 Paul says, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. Paul says that the Jews were ignorant of God's righteousness. How did that happen? I'll tell you how. They had to develop a religion that they improved it. And you know what? There's a lot of religions out there that do that today. And you know how you do that? The only way you can, the only way you can do that <coughs> you take righteousness okay and you take God's up here and man's down here what you do is you elevate man and you bring God down. That's how you can do that. That's how you can get a feel-good religion that will make you feel as if you're righteous. See, the Jews, the Pharisees, underestimated God's holiness. And because they underestimated His holiness, they underestimated His judgment. And because they underestimated his judgment, they underestimated his wrath. And because they underestimated his wrath, they became elevated sinners. They became convenient uh, believers in the Lord. They underestimated the holiness of God, and you, they overestimated their own righteousness. How were the Pharisees righteous? by the law. And the Ten Commandments weren't enough, so they made another 632. They had lost for everything. And 
those laws made them righteous. They elevated their ability to be righteous. Because they kept the laws. Or they thought they kept the law. And what Paul says is that if you continue there in Romans 10, he speaks about that they sought to establish in verse, uh, in verse 3, they sought to establish their own righteousness. See, when you have a religion that's based upon how you feel, anytime you feel good, it means you're doing right. How do Mormons get saved? They pray to God that God will illuminate to them the truth of Joseph Smith. And if Joseph Smith is a true prophet of God, they will have, they quote unquote in their doctrine, they will have a burning in their bosom. And a burning in their bosom, according to Joseph Smith, means they feel good about it. When does feeling good and they, there's churches that have preached this Sunday morning. When does feeling good equate to holiness? You know who wants you to feel good about your holiness? The deceiver. He wants you to feel, he wants you to be complacently, complacently uh, assured of your holiness. He wants you to think back, sit back and think, man, I'm holy. I feel good about it, so I must be holy. But the Jews, Paul says they were seeking to establish their own righteousness. And the only way you can establish your own righteousness is by lowering God and elevating man. All cults do the same thing. Every cult, what the, who's, who's Jesus in Mormonism? Who's Jesus in the Jehovah Witnesses and the Watchtower, Watchtower Society? Who is Jesus in these cults? He's always low. Who's Jesus in, in, in uh, Islam? He's a prophet. He's a wise man. He's like third on the post court underneath Allah and Muhammad. Jesus is always lowered, and man is always elevated in all of these religions. So they they being the Pharisees were wrong about themselves and therefore they did not subject themselves. See, when you understand the true righteousness of God, then you understand how incapable you are of reaching God's righteousness unless something happens. And what has to happen? Well, you have to get faith. And how do you get faith? Good non-denominational theologians how do you get faith? Well, it has to be the only way you can get up, get up this, yeah, God isn't going to go down for you, okay? The only way you can get up is, is by the generation of this faith, and the only way you can reach a level of righteousness that you're called to is it has to be imputed to you by one who's able to impute. That's the only way you can get up that ladder, is that you have to have Someone give you righteousness. Remember I call it alien righteousness? Because it's something that is not of you. It's foreign to your natural nature. And in verse 4, therefore, they in fact rejected Christ, Paul writes, who is the, and then listen to this phrase, who is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Jesus is the end of the law of righteousness. Jesus, he put the big X in the law of righteousness because you don't need the law of righteousness. You have righteousness. As a child of God, you have been imputed righteousness. It's right there in that verse. See, they thought God was not as holy as he really is, and they thought they were far more holy than they really are. So they were pleased. The Pharisees were pleased with their own self-righteousness. The rich man was pleased with his own self-righteousness. And they didn't understand that righteousness had to be imputed to them because they didn't look in the scriptures and 
look at imputation in the scriptures which are in the Old Testament. They did not understand that they needed a sin bearer, even though they partook of the sacrificial system on almost a daily basis. They didn't understand that they needed to be an end to the law's condemnation by the death of the substitute who could compute the righteousness to the sinner. And they didn't understand that they had to live a life based on faith and faith alone. Faith and faith alone. They thought that they could maintain the law because they thought they were good enough to do it. They thought they could maintain the law because they were good enough to do it. Okay? So back to our text of the rich man. A Jew, and very much the picture of a Pharisee, he's damned and he knows he's damned. And he knows he didn't obey the scriptures. And he knows his brothers aren't obeying him either. And sadly, in essence, he blames God for his dilemma. Because the inference that he makes is that he didn't get enough information. The rich man believes that he didn't get enough information to save him from hell. It's as if he says, if you guys had a, a better method of your evangelism, I wouldn't be in this predicament. And my brothers are going to be here too if you don't come up with a better system. And I tell you what you need to do. You need to send someone back to warn them. Send somebody back from the dead to my brothers to warn them. That's a powerful sign. That will convince them. Then they'll listen. Then they'll be in heaven. That's the Pharisee and the rich man talking. The Pharisees always wanted signs. Luke 11, 16, uh, they, they, it says that they tried to test Jesus and they sought from him a sign from heaven. So the Pharisees didn't have enough signs, you see. That's what they say. All the miracles, all the healings, all the feedings, all that, all of that stuff wasn't enough. They needed another sign. And the problem was that even if he had a, you know, if Jesus had had a sign that hung down from the stars, a big neon sign that pointed with a big arrow at him that said Messiah and blinked on and off with a bunch of little lights all around the edge, that still wouldn't have been a good enough sign for the Pharisees. Nothing was enough for the Pharisees because they lacked in belief and faith. Jesus gave them his resurrection. Did they believe him? In essence, no. So Jesus in our story speaks for Abraham and he says, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither, neither will they be persuaded to one rise from the dead. Do we really understand what he's saying when he says that? You know, you would think if somebody came back from the dead, that would do it. Don't you think? If somebody, if we had a friend today that died, and if we had a funeral in here in the castle, and they got up, oh. <laughs> what would be the impact on, on us? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> You know, and if, if, it's somebody that, if it's somebody that's here at the church, then it's somebody we know. It wouldn't work very well if we didn't know him. It wouldn't have as great an impact on us. That's why Lazarus is named here, and because of what his name is, uh, Lazarus means God has blessed. The brothers knew Lazarus. If Lazarus uh, came back from the dead, they would know who he was when he showed up. But Jesus says if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, there's not any way to persuade them. Not even a resurrection, to paraphrase what he says, will convince them. It's not, see, Jesus says it's not that I'm withholding information. It's just that the information won't do you any good. It ain't going to help you, huh? The world knows of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay? I say to you, just keep this in mind, folks. Look, there's no other way to get people, to save people, to keep people from hell than to expose them to the saving message of Jesus Christ. 
change the message in favor of a method is just plain crazy and it's ridiculous. To use every possible method to proclaim the true message is necessary, but the message is what saves and nothing else saves. Not even if somebody rises from the dead. Look at John 11. Uh, a few months after the incident, uh, the story in Luke 16, in John 11, Jesus is walking on his way to Jerusalem, and he stops in Bethany. And what does he do in Bethany? He raises another Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus is dead. How long has he been in the tomb? Four days. He's truly dead. He's stinky dead by now. He's so dead that he has to smell. And Jesus raises him from the dead, and in verse 43 it says, Now when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. I'm glad he said Lazarus. Because he had everybody in every tomb would have been talking about. Come forth, they all would have been coming out of there. And he who had died came out and says, Bound hand and foot with gray clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. So here you have, okay, so here you have, what does, the wise, what does the rich man want? Send somebody from the dead to testify to my brothers, okay, so that they'll believe and they'll end up going to heaven. So you, here you have Lazarus, this other Lazarus, being raised from the dead. So what does verse 45 say? Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen these things Jesus did believed in him. They believed in him. Now that doesn't that does that doesn't necessarily they believe they believe the truth of Jesus. They believed in what he did. And then it says, because, but some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. Why do you think they went to the Pharisees? went to the Pharisees and put a finger on them. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? And listen to these words. For this man works many signs. They kept asking him for more signs, didn't they? How many signs has he done? Well, they say he's done many signs. And then they say, If we, if we let him alone like this, Everyone will believe in him. Oh, pray tell. What a terrible thing. Everyone will believe in Jesus. What a horror that would be for them. They can't think. They can't think of anything worse. And they continue. And the Romans will come and take away our place and nation. Now that is a truthful statement. They're worried about the first one. Their place. They don't really don't care about their nation. Let me tell you, they didn't have a nation. When the Romans occupied you, the Romans occupied you. The Romans were the most powerful nation on earth. But they did have places. And they're worried about the places. And then one of them, Caiaphas, who's the high priest that year, who's corrupt, said to them, he says, you know nothing at all. Do you know what that means? You know nothing at all. He says, you're a bunch of idiots. That's what that means. You're stupid. You know nothing at all. In other words, you have no knowledge at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people. In other words, we have to kill this guy and not the whole nation so the whole nation won't perish. They don't care about the whole nation. All they care about is their place. So, do you hear their response? Does anyone say, let's go find Lazarus? Lazarus is alive, right? Does anyone say, let's go find Lazarus and find out what he's been doing for four days? Nobody asked that question. Uh, let's, let's go hear a testimony from Lazarus. Let's go see what Lazarus has to say. Let's go hear what Jesus has to say about raising people from the dead. But they don't ask any of those questions. All they can think about is how fast can we kill the man who raises people from the dead because we're going to lose our position. It's extraordinary. Right there, 
there you have a picture of one coming back from the dead. It did them no good. See, nobody, no, listen to me. You know, you go to a Benny Hinn revival, people are getting saved because of miracles. People don't just get saved because of miracles. It doesn't work that way. The Word does not teach that people get saved by miracles. It's the message. Remember, Jesus, when He healed the one guy that let down through the roof, uh, uh, be healed, and then He said, and go and sin no more. He was, he was, he was miraculously healed, but He was still a sinner. Go and sin no more. Okay? We know that these people, it says they believed, they believed in the power of Jesus. And we might assume that they, they believed in, that even if Jesus claimed that he was who he claimed to be. But they had to have known, to really understand, to really believe him, they'd have to understand who he really was and what his message was. And what it meant to be satanly transformed. And what the Pharisees believed is all... All they wanted to do was to find a man who had risen somebody from the dead so they could look at them. Later in 12.10, so he, they could kill him. Later in 12.10 it says, but the chief priest plotted. This is what, so Lazarus is dead, has, has been dead for four days. He's brought back to life. And in 12.10 it says, but the chief priest plotted to put Lazarus to death also. Come on. The guy's, are, the guy's already been dead once. And they want to kill him again. And these are the most religious men in their country. These are the guys that are sitting behind the pulpits of their country. And these are the guys that are teaching people about how to be good little Jews. Yeah. They're the teachers. They're the scribes. They're the ones that people are looking to for knowledge. They want to kill Lazarus again. Someone rises from the dead, and then everybody's going to believe that's what the rich men thought. But that's not right. Somebody rose from the dead. What do they want to do with Lazarus? They want to kill him again. He's evidence. Let's get rid of him. Look at Matthew 28. I'm not going to go through the whole uh, the whole resurrection. I'm almost done. But. Where, where Christ is risen, or should I say, you know, in, in Matthew 28, why do they put, why do they secure the team, the tomb? So we can't get out of there. They're scared. What are they scared of? <laughs> yeah, that's why they put those guards there. So we, um, in Matthew 28, the Sabbath begins, the earthquake comes, the angel of the Lord descends, the stone rolls away, Roll, is rolled away in verse 6. Jesus alive. He is not here. He is risen, as he said. And in verse 11, it says, Now while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priest all the things that had happened. And you know what they reported? They don't say it, but you know what they reported? They reported a resurrection. That's what they reported. That's all they could report. They reported the truth. Those guards, are, those guards are, they're like the, the honor guard. They're like, they're like the, the very, very, very best of the best. Those are the guys that take their job seriously serious. You guys know that we're in the military, those guys like that. Their response, they respond in a way that indicates that there was someone who returned from the dead. And then it says, when they had assembled all the elders and consulted the gator, the, the, they consulted the gator together, what did they do for the soldiers? They gave them a big lump of money. They bribed them. That was their answer to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They bribed them. And they told them what to tell people. Tell them his disciples came at night and stole them away while we slept. Oh yeah, I want to commit suicide. Because that's what that means for a Roman centurion who's supposed to be a guard or, a cent, uh, or someone underneath the centurion. If you fall asleep at your position, you're dead. They're going to kill you. 
And then they say, uh, if this comes to the governor's ears, if the boss, we will appease him and make you secure. Don't worry. If the governor hears that you fell asleep at your post, we'll still, we'll still be able to, uh, we will do something to appease him and you'll be okay. And then it says, so they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. They told the people that his body was stolen. But, so the people, what do they think? His body was stolen. What do the Pharisees know? That he rose. So, did that change their mind? Did that make them believers of all this stuff that we've been talking about that they should have believed? Because it was all in the scriptures, obviously. Because a man like Lazarus, the first man, Lazarus, in Luke 16, who was crippled, who was so maim that in the Greek it says they threw him at the rich man's gate. He couldn't walk, they just threw him there. He knew enough to get to heaven. But all these wise guys, all these seminarians couldn't figure it out because they possessed elevated righteousness. And you can tell they weren't good Baptists because they didn't even form a committee. They should have formed a committee and said, let's go. They should have had a find Jesus committee. We're at First Baptist Club this month. I would have volunteered. I would have been, I would have said, yeah, man, I'm going to make it. Let's go find Jesus. If he's alive, if he's out of that grave, let's go find him and listen to what he said. But see, they didn't care about what Jesus said. Jesus was of inconvenience. They didn't believe the book. They, they didn't, they, 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 none of these things, they didn't acquire. They didn't listen to the message of the scripture. Why do you think the Jewish people have so suffered? Is there any other race in the world that has suffered like the Jews? Because they have all those privileges. The scriptures say in Luke 7 or Luke 11 that their judgment is more severe than the judgment on Nineveh because why? Because a greater one than Jonah came to them. Who's, who's greater than Jonah? Jesus. Did they believe him? No. And judgment is greater than in the time of Solomon because one greater than Solomon came to them. Who's greater than Solomon? Jesus. The judgment will be greater, it says, because the Son of God walked in their midst and they ignored him. Listen to me. That's a very basic theological theory. When you receive great revelation and you reject it, you're going to burn hotter in hell. Because there's degrees of punishment in hell. Just as there are rewards in heaven. So listen to the words of Jesus in John 12, 46. I'm almost done. I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, listen to what Jesus says, I do not judge him. See, all these, all these, well, you can't judge me. You can't judge me. And then he continues, you don't judge. For I do not come to judge the world, he says. Jesus didn't come to judge the world. What did he come to do? I came to save the world. And then he continues, he who rejects me and does not receive my words, has that which judges him. The words that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. You don't judge anybody. When you tell people of the gospel and they give you that baloney, you don't judge me. All you say is, this is what judges you. It's the word that judges. Every person is damned to an eternal hell, is going to be damned to an eternal hell by the word, which is the truth. Okay? The 
and that will be what renders its judgment on all those who refuse. They refuse to believe. Not that they don't know, they refuse to believe. How do you escape hell? How do you enter into heaven? You believe the saving gospel that's revealed in the Bible. And you know that there's no other name above heaven given among men where we must be saved in the glorious name of Jesus Christ. Trust Him, and in Him alone, put your faith in Him, repent of your sin, the grace of God will pour into your life, and you will be redeemed, and regenerated, and renewed. And you will spend forever, then, in the glory of heaven. Oh no, how did I end up in hell? How? How did the rich man end up in hell? He was a very religious man. He had great theological background. He knew of repentance. He knew of sin. He knew of the law. He knew of judgment. But he had an elevated self-righteousness. He had a corrupt heart. And because of that corrupt heart, both he and his brothers were going to spend an eternity in hell. Oh, no. Anybody else? Any thoughts? Comment? The two guards of the stone. Yeah. The vision that they had during the night. You have to wonder just what they saw, how they felt, what went through their minds, and kind of, you know, what happened to them? I mean, that would be such a... Well, what happened to them? They took a bribe. Yeah. Yeah, I think they went to the high priest and described the resurrection. Yeah. Yeah. You might see that. Being able to describe the resurrection.